the work I've done. Speaking on the history of, uh, of sponge diving in Tartan Springs, and I'll start uh, with that. I'll uh, probably add a little bit of my family's personal ties to that history, and then we can uh, talk about how I make the diving helmets. Now, so uh, the first thing, uh, the history of uh, sponge diving in Tartan Springs would be how did the sponge diving and the you know how did it uh, come to Tartan Springs? So the 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 story really. Uh, begins, or I'll begin it in the Bahamas, you know, because it, the sponging came to the Western Hemisphere. We don't know how long ago. We know uh, that it's been thousands of years the Greeks were diving for sponge, uh, you know, in, the, in Europe. And I suspect that, uh, you know, they, even though they may not have been diving, you know, the people uh, in this hemisphere, uh, Bahamians, Cubans, uh, anywhere where they have, uh, you know, the, the conditions for sponge to grow, we suspect uh, sponging activity took place, you know. So uh, I'll begin at, say, in 1841 in the Bahamas. A French merchant uh, was in the uh, Bahamas. He saw the locals looking for sponge. And, of course, uh, if you know what hooking for sponge is, uh, this is a sponge hook. And uh, the way you hook for sponge is one of these hooks. However, it's on a pole 20 to 30 feet long. And they'd be in shallow water, and they would descend this the, the pole down uh, and, and bring the, you know, and put the sponge and kind of work it up and then bring it up to the dinghy. And so he observed this uh, of them hooking. So what he did was he, he took some examples of, their, of, of the sponges, uh, shipped them to Europe, you know, to see what the reaction would be. And uh, over the next few years uh, of doing that, it started to become a, a commercial enterprise where they were exporting sponge from the Bahamas to the European market. And so uh, from there, we have, uh, we know that the, some Bahamians uh, left the Bahamas, came across to the Florida Bay and to the Keys here and started hooking sponge. Now the uh, Cubans were also here doing it, as well as the locals, the conks, uh, you know, were were hooking sponge as well uh, in these waters. Now, uh, through the 1860s, 1870s, uh, there was a slow migration from down South Florida going up to the uh, up the Gulf Coast. By the 1860s, 1870s, that you had. Uh, uh, 1860s, 1870s, you had uh, the, the Cubans, the Bahamians, uh, and the locals. It wasn't, you know, in Tartan Springs, you know, it was both the, uh, you know, the locals, uh, the white and African Americans were all uh, participating, you know, in this hooking, but it wasn't a, a large uh, commercial enterprise at all. It didn't really become a, a large commercial uh, enterprise until a gentleman named John K. Shaney. Uh, took note. And John K. Shaney was a wealthy uh, uh, financier and businessman from Philadelphia. And uh, he had many holdings in Florida. And in the 18, I believe it was in the 1890s or 1880s, actually, he noticed the activity down in the uh, Keys, where the, actually down in here in the Keys, uh, where they were hooking sponge. And so, you know, he took note of this and didn't really forget about now, so in the eighteen uh, in the eighteen nineties, uh, John Shaney started making it, uh, started uh, making it a more uh, commercially viable enterprise. You know, and he formed a, a sponge company with offices in the Tartan Springs and in Philadelphia. Now, Shaney uh, would hire technical experts and people who really knew the business. You know, from uh, how to get the sponge how to uh, pack the sponge, you know, to, to cure them and to uh, export them. And so uh, and to do it, he hired a, a gentleman named uh, John Coperus. And John Coperus had this knowledge. He was from the islands of Greece. He worked for another sponge company called the Limbesis Sponge Company in New York. Uh, and uh, the only reason I bring up that name is my next door neighbor in Tartan Springs, is Bandelis Limbesis, uh, who tell me stories of his great grandfather founding the company. And Tartan's a small community that's strange. Uh, 
<laughs> history never really dies in Tartan Springs. You know, it's always it's always present in some form. So uh, John Coper, I worked for this company, left and began working for John Cheney. Now uh, Coper's was very very uh, uh, astute uh, uh, businessman himself. And he had a, like I believe three brothers, and what they did was they took a boat, uh, a hook boat outfitted it for a diving, put a compressor on it and all, went out. The name of the boat was Elpis, E-L-P-I-S, which in Greek is hope and all. So they went out in this vessel and uh, they couldn't believe uh, the extent of the sponge beds, how vast they were and, and, and the quality of the sponge. Um, so he kept, uh, you know, he, picked the, uh, he picked the sponge, you know, brought them in and soon word started getting out, you know, how bountiful it was. Um, you would see stories in Greek newspapers. Uh, word got to the islands that, uh, you know, the amazing sponge beds that we had here in Tarpon Springs and all. And so before you knew it, you had uh, 500 divers coming over, uh, not just divers, but, uh, you know, deckhands, uh, the, all men with expertise in uh, gathering sponge, curing them, and, you know, all aspects of the business. Now, Tartan Springs, uh, back then, uh, this was a, a, the crescendo of this, this diaspora, where the, you know, we had 500 people. It was around 1905 come over and all. And uh, the population, Tartan Springs at the time, was more a resort town for wealthy northerners, you know. And the local population only numbered three or 400 people. So it was quite a culture shock, I'm sure, for both the, the 500 Greeks who showed up in Tartan Springs and the three or 400 locals who, you know, had, you know, I'm sure they were very uh, uh, surprised, you know, and, and it really changed the dynamics uh, of the town forever and all. Now, part of this first uh, diaspora was uh, my great grandfather, uh, Theophilus Lirios, and his son. Nicholas Lirios, and uh, they were uh, boat uh, captains and divers and all, and this is uh, uh, what they did. Now, my grandfather uh, was younger than uh, Nicholas, you know, and I'll sort of bring in uh, my, uh, my family's, you know, my grandfather's tied to the, uh, to the uh, uh, business, I guess, at this point. Uh, my grandfather, uh, Anthony Lirios, was born in 1891 in Kalinos, a small island, uh, you know, uh, in the Dodecanese. Uh, at the age of five, my grandfather and his family moved to Constantinople, or Istanbul, the Greeks call it Constantinople, <laughs> and all. But uh, so he went from this tiny island, very primitive, I'm sure at the time, to this uh, huge metropolis. Now, my grandfather loved. Uh, uh, knowledge. He was he, had, he was always reading. He's just not to to, to use the, the term. He was a sponge to absorb. Who <laughs> just absorbed everything? Not just the technical aspects and all, but the, he just loved learning everything there was to learn. He would tell me stories growing up of uh, how he would uh, be in school. His father would always want him to take him out of school and put him to work. You know. And it must have been a fairly young age because my grandfather did start working at 13. Uh, he graduated high school and was, uh, I think, 11 or 12 years old and all. And then uh, he did go to start working. And what he did was he went to some of the great shipyards in uh, Istanbul. And this is where they built ocean liners and freighters. And what he did was he started out as an apprentice to a machinist. And I would often hear the stories of the uh, uh, of how the master uh, uh, would treat the apprentice, and all you know, he he said if uh, one of the apprentices wasn't paying attention, you know, he might get a slap across the head to you know to to help him focus <laughs> and, all, and stuff. But he also told me these stories of uh, of how large these shops were and uh, how dangerous it was. And what my grandfather did was, uh, of course, he became a master machinist after apprenticing and he was still very young and all. 
and he would uh, just tell me all the stories of, uh, of how these steam engines, you know, it was all steam engines at the time, and how enormous they were. And I'm sure all of you have seen the movie Titanic, uh, and when uh, they're going through the engine room, and you see the guys shoveling coal into the furnaces, and you see these enormous pistons going, you know, up two stories and coming back down, and all. And these are the stories I grew up on, uh, listening to my grandfather talk about, uh, you know, what it was like in these uh, in these yards. So uh, he uh, uh, had, he kept. Uh, uh, lost my train of thought. Oh. What he did was uh, he kept, uh, you know, he went from being a master machinist and he continued. And because he had such knowledge of how these things operated and he designed them, he was also, he you know, became an engineer and not just a master machinist. And by the time he was 22 years old, my grandfather was actually running the uh, entire shipyard and all, which is, you know, when you think about that, some of that age and all. Now, this was, uh, you know, the turn of the last century. This was probably 1911, 1912, you know. And by 1913, uh, he saw troubles coming to, to, to uh, Istanbul as for the Greeks that, that were there. They were starting to confiscate the property, um, conscript some of the Greeks into the Turkish army, and you know? also he saw the writing on the wall. And uh, so he, he knew he had to leave. Now, prior... To his leaving in that first diaspora that I spoke about a few minutes ago in 1905, you know, his father and brother Nicholas had left and, and come to Tartan Springs, you know, and were working. Now they had, he tells me the story of them sending him a letter, you know, uh, implying some emergency, you know, something serious had happened. And my grandfather would tell me, oh, uh, you know, that he thought, you know, something bad has happened to my dad, my brother. I, you know, I need to go there. So he was leaving. He had to leave uh, Turkey anyway. So what he did was he tells me the story where he went back to Kalimos, saw his mother uh, who had moved there and had become a, a head nun at a monastery uh, in Kalimos and all. And then he hopped a freighter and uh, they went from port to port and then across uh, the Atlantic. He told me the trip took three months, uh, you know, before he finally made it to New York, uh, to Ellis Island, and that was July 7th, 1913, when he arrived. Now, uh, again, he was used to the big city uh, and all the amenities and advantages, you know, that he had culturally uh, in, uh, in Istanbul. And so he kind of said he liked New York. However, he got on the train, came down uh, to Tarpon Springs, uh, right there to the train station where which is the historical society now in Tarpon Springs which has been helpful in, in the exhibit and all but the you know, he got off the train and he tells me the story you know that, that he goes first thing he noticed uh, the streets weren't paved you know a few paved streets and you know, there were you know animals running around and, and stuff and the, it was a very I can only imagine how small Tarpon was then you know again it was only in the hundreds the population so he said, uh, you know, his first thought was to get back on the train, go to New York, <laughs> you know, where he might uh, you know, pursue his passions there. And all. however, he stayed uh, and met my grandmother. And, uh, you know, uh, it's the reason I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and all. So, you know, that's a little bit about my grandfather. But the, the reason they needed him uh, to the, they sent the letter was they didn't have anyone with his technical skills uh, in Tarpon. That, I mean, there were mechanics and machinists, but no one really like uh, my grandfather, who was a really, a, a, you know, a, a advanced uh, in some of the things he was doing and all. So, uh, you know, that's how he wound up here. He said from this letter, uh, you know, that was sent that he thought it was some family tragedy and ended up being they needed someone with his expertise to to basically, you know, to get the uh, the fleet going, to keep the, you know, it expanded. Now, I'm known as a helmet maker and, you know, and people know my grandfather for the helmets that he makes. You know, however, again, he was so much more. Uh, he was actually, you know, anything that wasn't wood on a boat, my grandfather uh, basically had made would make patterns for 
go take it to a foundry, machine it, you know, you create whatever it was, uh, stern bearing, stuffing boxes, machine the propeller shaft, make propeller guards, we make the hardware for these huge dive ladders, uh, make the anchors, the rollers for the anchors. Uh, before there were diesel engines, we have, I still have patterns for pulleys and things for sailing vessels and all. So when it was, you know, it was sail power. And also, and my grandfather uh, in around 1919 installed the first diesel engine. Uh, it was a Sterling Engine Company in Miami. And, uh, and we, the gentleman's name was Mr. Hooper because he would still come to Tarpon Springs when I was a teenager and all. And they would uh, joke together with my grandfather, you know, they remembered it, you know, about putting that first diesel in. And one of the stories was when he put that diesel in there, that it had a, a defect, it was overheating, and my grandfather figured out what the uh, problem was with the cooling system, uh, rerouted some things on it, and got it to work properly. And so uh, Mr. Hooper would always come and joke uh, with my grandfather, Tony, I thought I was gonna show you something, and you know, it ended up teaching me something <laughs> about diesel engines. So there was some of the cool stories that I heard you know, growing up and, and being around. Now, uh, so he did everything, you know, it wasn't just the helmets, which we became, you know, known for because the helmet's an iconic uh, symbol, uh, you know, of, of diving. You know, I, I just like the sign out there says, you know, it's a, a symbol of man's quest to explore, you know, the, the world in the, uh, underwater, you know. So uh, he did so much more. However, you know, the helmets became the, you know, the, the object uh, that uh, most people have started focusing on. And I was always fascinated with the helmets too, because I'd watched my grandfather making helmets when I was small or repairing them. And I always thought they were just the coolest thing. You know, all the other things were just shafts and bolts and, you know, whatever you were uh, machining, couplings and things. So, you know, the helmet, I loved science fiction when I was a kid, 1950s sci-fi movies and this looks so much like something from a 1950s sci-fi movie a robot or something that i was just fascinated looking at these things and all and so uh, i grew up around the machine shop uh, from the time i was probably three years old and it wasn't just a machine shop we we're on the ankle river and uh, there's a uh, right next to our shop uh, literally from me to you you're 10 15 feet away was a boat yard where they built the uh, the wood hulls. And they built all the wood boats, uh, sponge boats and fishing boats. And also my earliest memories uh, are being there, you know, from three, four years old, running around, watching the old timers, uh, you know, build these boats using the cross axes that they're so, Greeks are so famous for using, you know, and, and shaping and, and notching things and putting together hulls the large vats with fires under them to steam the wood, to be able to soften and make it easier to bend the ribs and all the work. So this is the, the, sort of the things that I grew up watching, and, you know, and, and all the things that went with it. Um, some of my pursuits uh, down at the uh, machine shop in the, in the boat yard when I was that young were basically uh, trying to stay out of trouble, but sometimes it found me, I would take uh, metal rods. I knew how to start up the grinder and all. And so I'd take a metal rod and I'd put a sharp point on it and make a, a spear. And so then I would take the spear and I'd go at the water's edge and I'd see if I could harpoon, you know, a mullet or something. Of course, I never came close to hitting a fish. And that, however, I discovered aerosol cans, spray paint cans. And so I would, Go over, grab a, a can that the, the boat builders would use to mark things and stuff, set it up on something and throw my uh, spear at it until I hit that can. And, you know, it's, paint would go all over the place. The old timers would come out yelling, Nico, you know, Ticanis, what are you doing? And stuff. <laughs> and all the, well, they loved me. And, and all the, but <laughs> some of the earlier memories. Now, as I got older, my grandfather, I would also, uh, even when I was a kid, there were still probably 50 sponge boats uh, in operation in, in, in Tarpon Springs. And uh, I have memories of carrying toolboxes for my grandfather 
and you know the boats were all tied off uh, next to each other with so many and carrying these tool boxes and stepping over the side and going from boat to boat you know carrying them putting them down watching my grandfather go down to the engine room and all and the you know following down there and always thinking you know can we go eat lunch can we go do something you know and then you know ending up picking them up and going to another boat and going down <laughs> but the some of the earliest memories, but also when I was probably 10, 11 years old, uh, he would have me in the machine shop as I learned to do more things, stand at the lathe. And what he would do is he would put my hands on the control of the lathe. Not a lathe, if you know, is how you shape metal. Um, it has a chuck, you put your part on, it spins around, you have a blade that goes back and forth, you know, and either inside or outside, you know, machines apart, you know. And so, he would take my hands, put them on the controls, the two wheels, and all. Then he put his hands over my hands, and then he would turn it, and all. He wanted me to see how much, uh, you know, what it felt like to cut metal and watch it coming off of the thing, curling off, you know, the the shavings and things, and how much you were supposed to take, how it was supposed to feel. And he would show me, you know, how to take the calipers, the things we use to measure. Uh, and all and put them on the outside, you know, how it's supposed to feel or inside, and, you know, not too tight, not loose, no play, you know, and just by feel, you know. And so this is how I learned. My I never intended to become a helmet maker and all, you know, when I graduated college, I was, you know, thinking, you know, am I going to grad school? Am I going to go to law school? You know, what do I want to do? And all, but, uh, you know, I kind of, stayed with it uh, you know when i graduated i'm helping my grandfather uh, uh with making the diving helmets he felt if i knew how to to make a diving helmet i'd be a, a master machinist or, you know just because you have to know so much uh, and be so accomplished to uh, you know to to machine all the parts to the tolerances necessary you know so you know, make a, a good diving helmet so but that's how I learned, you know, I, I didn't realize how much I had picked up over the years. And then when he started really uh, showing me, uh, you know, how you know, to, to do it, and I was actively trying to learn, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is the result. <laughs> Here I am many decades later, <laughs> and I'm doing it. Now, in Tarpon, there were only uh, three helmet makers. And the, the earliest helmet maker in Tarpon Springs uh, was a gentleman named Antonio Sabgenimos. And this is one of his helmets here. Um, this helmet, uh, I suspect, is from the 1920s and all. Now, Sabgenimos was a helmet maker from Greece. Uh, he was born in 1860. He passed away in 1930. Uh, he came over in 1911, I think it was something like that. But they brought him over because the industry just liked needing someone like my grandfather to uh, pursue, uh, you know, to 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 do whatever was necessary to create the sponge boats and build the fleet. They also needed a helmet maker, and so they brought him. He had studied in France and all, and then uh, you know was uh, in an island called Egina which uh, is fairly well known for the, uh, the quality of the helmets that were made there, you know. So they got him to come over, like I said, around 1911, and he had a, a small shop uh, there on Athens Street, and uh, it was more like a, a, a blacksmith shop. Um, he had a furnace in there, and uh, you know, he would cast his own grass and all, and you know, and then had lathes with machine it. I mean, he did everything was from scratch uh, in his shop. And the reason I know this is because uh, my grandfather, when he, after he arrived, uh, my grandfather was busy all the time. I mean, uh, he, he had boundless energy. I mean, uh, into his very late year, he lived to be 101. I mean, into his late nineties, I mean, we were working together. Uh, I was very fortunate to have my grandfather until I was 37 years old. So uh, my grandpa, you know, uh, again, he was always working, always busy. However, uh, 
again, he was in his early 20s when he got here. And Avgenimos was uh, 30 years older than, than my grandfather. Now, my grandfather would tell me stories that he would go after work uh, in, in the evenings and help uh, Avgenimos because uh, from the stories my grandfather would tell me, it sounded like he was suffering from emphysema. You know, probably because of the soot and the smoke there in his blacksmith shop, you know. And so I would ask my grandfather, I go, well, you know, he would help him. I go, well, did you, did you also make helmets? And he said, well, I would if somebody really insisted I'd do it. He says, but I never wanted to take, in Greek, he would tell me, I never wanted to take bread out of another person's mouth. And he had so much work to do. And he said he really loved uh, Avgenos. He said he was a really nice old man. And, and, and all, and so you know, he would go in there and you know help out and uh, and all, and uh, until he passed away in 1930. And after that, you know, he is when the majority of my grandfather's helmets, or he would produce them because there was no one else uh, to do it. And and uh, you know, this is a really a nice uh, example uh, of of his work. And all, and it's in really nice condition. Uh, it's really a prized possession. I was very fortunate to uh, come across this helmet many years ago. You know, when I saw it, uh, a local whose family was in the sponging business, you know, wanted to sell it, and uh, you know, I said, "Are you sure?" You know, because you want to sell this thing. He goes, "Yeah." I go, he had come to me to appraise it. I said, "Are you sure you want to sell this?" I go, "I would not." You know, and he said, "I'm going to." I said, okay, you know what? I will buy it from you <laughs> and I'll do it. So this is a, you know, a, a helmet that the first helmet maker tarpon, Antonio Sao getting those. Now, you know, this is one of my grandfather's helmets right here. Uh, and all. this one uh, is a special helmet to me. Uh, this was probably made, uh, I believe it was 82, 83, somewhere in there. Uh, we made this. Now, the reason this helmet means so much to me is uh, when we were making it, we knew this was going to be my helmet. And also, you know, it's, it's something that I would never sell. And all that, you know, it's just my fave. <laughs> and also, yeah. And, and um, he made a few changes uh, to the helmets. Uh, you know, nothing too drastic. Uh, but if you're to look at the I've got no helmet, the, the exhaust valve uh, on the on his helmets and most of the Greek helmets it is set fairly far back, and the exhaust valve or dump valve is it, it is the button. There's a button in there, and you keep hitting that with your head and all when you're diving. Now, sponge diving, your focus is on the bottom and all, and you're you know you're looking for sponge. You're basically almost running at an angle into the current and all. And so he felt it was, you know, difficult for the diver, you know, to, to be looking down and then doing this. So what he did, if you'll notice, it's a couple inches forward, more to the side here, where the diver, you know, would simply bump his, his head this way, you know, and exhaust the, the air out, you know. Um, pretty much, uh, there's not that many differences in these two helmets and all. You know, they both believe, and if you've seen some helmets, they have a more, or breastplates have a more rounded front. Uh, he felt a more tapered uh, front would uh, give the diver more freedom of movement with his arms, you know, and how to, uh, uh, you know, when he's collecting the sponge and all. So, you know, that's uh, really the uh, changes. And he'd like to put a slight angle on this front uh, porthole here. He would uh, tilt it slightly forward. Again, you've seen helmets where it looks like the uh, you know it's just straight up and down on your face. Uh, and he felt, and you'll notice it's flared out. Our helmets flare out a bit more, and this is almost directly it is directly on the bonnet uh, or the sphere of the bonnet. Whereas here, you know, it, it's flared out and it's a little further away from your face and and, and all. And he felt that was uh, an advantage as well. And you know, so, you know, these are, you know, this is a, a good example of my, you know, my grandfather's work. Now, his early helmets, uh, a little story that ties back here to the museum, is 
his early helmets did not have name tags on them uh, and all. He, and, and many of the helmets that were made, they didn't, you know, put name tags on them. He, to, to him, you know, he was working, he made a piece of equipment and all, although he really tried to add his aesthetics to it, uh, you know, as you see some of the, uh, the, the cut corners on the rail and things, uh, just these little things that gave it more of an aesthetic element uh, and, and all. Uh, but the, Oh, and the point of this was not putting the tag on, you know. So back in the 1970s, I was in my teens. Well, I met a gentleman and a lady, uh, Joe and Sally Bauer, you know, and uh, they would come to Tartan Springs all the time uh, and all. And, uh, and you had to know Joe, you had to know his personality and all, his very powerful personality and stuff and assisting Tony. He goes, you need to put tags on your on your diving helmets. They need to have tags on. Them. And he even uh, helped come up with the, uh, you know, the cut corner design uh, and all. You know, my grandfather told him kind of what he wanted and all. And uh, Joe went out and uh, found uh, someone who made a, kind of a, a prototype uh, tag for the helmets and all, and then brought it to Tartan Springs and everything. And so we got the foundry to. Uh, you know, to make the tags for us and all that you see here made by Anthony Nerea's machine shop, Tartan Springs, Florida, USA, on there and stuff. So I, you know, it was just a, kind of a, an interesting thing. The dive world is a very small world. Uh, I, I've learned uh, from, uh, you know, uh, going out, you know, doing what I do and meeting all the people that are in the dive world. And, you know, it, it is a very small, close uh, community. So, that's how the uh, the tags wound up uh, on there. Now, my grandfather uh, passed away uh, in 1992, born in 1891, passed away in 1992. I was 37 years old at the time. I was very fortunate to have him for so long. Uh, so after he passed away, I stopped making uh, helmets for a couple of years. Uh, I did other jobs, I you know, machine shop stuff. I knew how to or Babbitt, if anyone knows what that is. Before ball bearings, there was Babbitt. It was kind of like lead sort of stuff that you melt and poured around a shaft, uh, usually drill holes and, and, uh, and, and chamfer in the pathways for uh, lubrication in it and all, but you know, they didn't have ball bearings yet. So I knew how to pour Babbitt. And also I could work on uh, very old machinery, like tanneries had, uh, in Tarkin had some very old machines that I was able to take in and overhaul. And I would, you know, just do these other uh, pursuits. It took me a few years. Uh, I didn't see passed away '92, so around '95, I started saying, you know, I want to, I'm going to start doing helmets again, but I want them to kind of reflect uh, my vision of what a diving helmet should look like, or at least a sponge diving helmet should be, and the aesthetics of it, and all. So, you know, I started the machining my grand idea was I'll build, uh, I forget how many I ended up doing, uh, eight or nine, 10. Uh, so I started making parts, you know, machining all the parts and all that I'll get to in a, in a minute and all. And, the, and then, you know, doing everything, you know, uh, however many of this, that, and the other. And so by 1997 is when I, beginning of 97, when I went out and uh, right started putting them together and completed my, you know, the first five, six elements uh, in 97. And I wanted to do something different. So, you know, I came up with an oval shaped tag. I didn't want to still use the cut corner tag. So I, I wanted to go ahead and I came up with an oval tag and everyone was saying, you have to put your name on it and this and that. So I went ahead and, you know, that's the tag that uh, I've been using ever since uh, that you see right there and all. And, uh, and also, you know, the, to me, uh, the aesthetics of it, uh, I've made the helmet a little heavier and most sponge diving helmets are 30, 32 pounds. You pick them up, it's a fishery hat, sponging's a fishery and they tend to be much lighter helmets uh, when you're uh, doing a fishery helmet. You know, the military hats, the Mark Fives weigh anywhere from 54 to I think 57 pounds depending on the rig. 
and all. And so these are much lighter helmets and all. So, uh, so maybe I should talk about. Uh, Do those have communications in them? Um, typically, no. Uh, there's not really a comm system uh, in these helmets. Um, the way they communicated, the divers communicated, was through the the the, the line tender. They had their signals and all. You know, they knew what tug meant what. You know that. Uh, Sending up a, you know, same time I was sending up a bag, you know, he'd take the sponge bag that he collected, tie it off, it goes up, you know, and then uh, drop, a, you know, then uh, empty it and drop the bag back down. Uh, they even have signals, uh, drop the spear gun or something. I see a fish for dinner. I mean, you know, and of course, they had signals when the diver is in trouble. You have the, the only comm system I really put into a diving helmet, a sponge diving helmet, uh, was uh, for Torrance Parker. <laughs> you know, a dear friend of mine had passed away the last few years and all, and uh, uh, really a great guy. And I did one uh, uh, for another gentleman, uh, uh, Dan Wilson, who uh, uh, who's uh, sort of the, the father of uh, sort of modern commercial diving we became good friends he had moved to tarpon springs and all of the sailboat lived there and uh, he's uh had the uh, in his uh, warehouse he had the purissima diving bell that i would go in and, and play i crawl in that thing you know just check it out do stuff but those are the only comm systems that i uh, put in diving helmets now my helmet weighs uh 38 pounds and the reason it does that is purely aesthetic uh, uh, reasons. Uh, the portholes on mine are a little thicker than you see on, on the other helmets and all, you know, and it just seemed like a shame to leave all that brass on the floor when I was machining it. And I just thought, you know, just dimensionally, it just, it just looks better, uh, you know, the aesthetics of it by leaving some of these things thicker. I tried to be a little more fancy on the machine work uh, that I do. And then of course my signature with all my work it tends to be uh, the highly uh, mirrored finish that I try to put on everything and only to amplify the, uh, the light hitting it and you know what you see how it plays off of the, the cut edges and stuff and all the different facets and my solder work. Uh, I tried to uh, have my solder work be part of the aesthetic. So my grandfather had tooling that he'd made for shaping, you know, getting the shapes I wanted to solder. And so I really, uh, you know, went at it with his tooling and came up with my own style, you know, of how I, the angle, how I wanted it to look uh, in all. And, uh, you know, on every, everywhere where brass meets copper, you know, I have this highly polished, you know, I even want it so I can see my uh, reflection in the solder work is what I tried to achieve, you know. Now, it takes me probably 350 hours uh, around to, to make one of these. Now, typically, you can, I can do a, a helmet uh, more quickly if I wasn't paying attention. You know, if I, it was just, I was making it, I knew the diver, you know, the boat is waiting. They need to, you know, they need the helmet and all. You know, it doesn't have to look like this to go diving. And as soon as you go diving with it, it will not look like this <laughs> and all. <laughs> But uh, you know the way we do them, you know, is unchanged since the mid 1800s. I mean, nothing has changed. Actually, nothing has changed uh, as far as how they're made from the very first helmets in the 1820s. You know, uh, when the Augustus C made the, his first closed circuit uh, uh, dive system. You know, so when I'm making a helmet, you know, I usually I start from the bottom up. You know, and I didn't bring a big sheet of copper to show you, but I have three foot by eight foot sheets of copper, you know, that I get. And, uh, and what I do is I take the sheet out to my welding table. I have a pattern here and all. And what I do is I put this over the copper, you know, trace it out and all. And then I cut out uh, my copper and, you know, and this is exactly, you know, except out of copper what it looks like and what i will do then is put this into a, a large cast iron mandrel i mean it's really heavy it's very very old and my grandfather uh, made 
and I'll and clamp it in on the sides here. And I have a wood mallet uh, that probably weighs three pounds or so. And I will sit there and pound it into this form. I'll just sit there and, and do it. Uh, I remember the first time uh, when I was learning to make diving helmets, and my grandfather, you know, showed me, went to the form, you know, put it in, and he started hammering. And he didn't stop for a couple minutes, just bam, 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 you know, hitting it and stuff and all. Then he stopped, handed me the mallet, said, go ahead, do it. I remember I did it for about a minute and all, and I thought my forearm was going to explode. <laughs> you know, it was so, you know, it just got so tight and stuff, you know. And eventually I learned, you know, to let the hammer do the work. And all, and I can feel it almost when you strike it correctly, it almost bounces. It's bouncing off the copper, you know, and, and when you're you're doing it, and you can last a lot longer uh, that way. So what I do is I'll take that, you know, hammer it out, and I'll get a shape of the breastplate uh, into the form. You know, now this one I I got this breastplate going. Uh, you know, but you can see, you know, this is how it comes. I it comes out of the form like this. And what will happen next, uh, before the neck ring can go on, is I will cut it. I, you know, I decide how much uh, height I want the neck ring off of the shoulders of my breastplate, straighten all this out, and I'll, you know, before, of course, the neck ring can go on it. So what I also do, as you can see, the first thing I do, because this is in its early stages, is, is to put the uh, outside uh, support on here. And so this is, you know, what that looks like in the beginning. And I should, at this point, maybe let you know that the, all these things are brass. And what we do is we have patterns, you know. In, in the old days, it'd be wood patterns that look just like these parts. And all you take it to a foundry, and they cast it for you in brass. Now, what, what are, and what we get back is called a rough casting. This is what a rough casting looks like. You can see all the jagged edges and slag. You still got to be careful, it, you know, cut you and everything. And so you just grind it off. You know, it's very rough. And also you just kind of, before you do anything, put it on the lathe and all. I just take it, you know, inside grinder, do something, you know, to, to kind of clean it up some, you know, you know, before it gets mounted on the lathe. So, but anyway, so, you know, take this rough casting. I'll, you know, before I do my helmets, I will smooth it out some, both sides. It goes into that same cast iron mandrel. Actually, I have uh, set up in the shop some steel bars, uh, and I have them uh, at a certain uh, distance from each other, uh, clamped together on a table, a steel table. And I'll, I'll put markings in, on, on this thing, you know, where I'm gonna make my bends and kind of get it going to get a general shape, just to get some bend to it. And then I will get that thing into that same form, clamp it into the form on the on the uh, sides on the shoulders here, and hammer it again so that it adheres to to the form and all. And then these two match. So once I've got that uh, marked up, then I will mark uh, you know where the uh, where the uh, studs were going to go. It's got holes in here, as you can see. So I marked it and I'll put the studs in for uh, the holes in here. And then I'll take bolts, put the shell and the, the brass piece together and, and, and with the, the bolts that I have and put it all together. And then I solder, you know, after I've got it together. And the way we do it uh, is that we wrap the copper, it's wrapped around the, uh, the, the, the brass. And if, when you look at helmets, it'll give you something, a different perspective when you're out there looking at all the helmets. You know, does the copper wrap around the brass this way, or is it just a, a sandwich almost where you see copper, uh, solder, and, uh, you know, and brass and stuff. My grandfather felt uh, it was better uh, aesthetically and for practical purposes to wrap it around, create a little bit more surface area, you know. And so this solder joint, you know, when you see this solder joint, it, it's not just soldered here. This solder joint, you know, it is soldered all the way through, and you can see solder here on top and here. So this is, you know, there's no way this thing, if you do it properly, you know, is, is going to fail. You know, that. 
So once I've gotten it this far, you know, the next thing I'm going to do, well, before I even get to that, what I do is I take all these parts here that you see, all these rough castings, and spend three or four weeks machining them. And, uh, you know, again, you know, this is what it starts out as, like that. This one is a main porthole. <clears throat> and then here you have, you know, a finished porthole, you know, and it's, see it threads together. This part goes into the helmet, you know, into the bonnet, and then this, you know, screws in and stuff. So yeah, I put it on the lathe, the same way that I still have the same, you know, lathes I use that my grandfather had a hundred years ago when he got here, but the, you know, so I, the same one where he put his hands over my hands, you know, is the ones I used to, uh, to uh, create these, uh, these parts. And what these are here, you know, it's a whole set to make a diving helmet, but these are, I call them sort of my master patterns. You know, my grandpa made these uh, for me when I was in my 20s, and I and said, you know, so I'd always have a reference guide when I'm making a diving helmet, uh, you know, how to, uh, you know, how to, uh, to, to take the measurements and, and to transfer, you know, onto my castings. And so, some of the things that I do take quite a while in machine work. Uh, this is the neck ring here. This is what the neck ring looks like from the foundry and all, you know, again, you know, put it on the, the big lathe. We have two couple lathes on our large lathe and machine it. Uh, it probably takes to, to do this. Uh, you're probably looking at a good 20, 24 hours of machine work. You know, to go from rough castings to this finished, uh, you know, the two rings. Now this one still screws. You know, it threads. You know, I can turn it round and round. You know, and it threads that way. However, of course, we don't put helmets on divers and spin the helmet round and round on his head. You know, so what I do is I interrupt the thread. You know, sort of like if you say camera housing or anything where you put the lens in, how it's, you know, you just put it and, and turn. So I basically, I remove half the thread, you know, I'll leave, you know, front, you know, back and on each side, you know, there'll be a thread and then there'll be blank spots there. So that when we put the, the helmet on the diver, you know, it's just an eighth of a turn down, you know, and, and locks into place. And also that's, you know, the next step of be beyond this, but I leave these this way because I take the measurements off of this and I use it and basically thread one onto the new piece and vice versa, just so I get a precise fit and all when I'm doing this. So once I've got that done, you know, this neck ring, when I get the, the copper where I want it, you know, there's a groove here and this would set right in here turn it upside down and I solder it, you know, into place, you know, and that's, uh, I'll do that first. After I do that, you know, I'll put the, I will machine the studs. You know, everything on the helmet that you see there, I have to make, uh, there is nothing that I can order <clears throat> from a catalog or go to a hardware store, you know, to get those kind of, those wing nuts or to, to, you know, to make, you know, and go buy studs like this, you know, just something I make. So basically I take round stock and all, and, uh, you know, put it on the lathe and just start machining, you know, run a, a, a die over it after I get it to the correct size, which puts the thread on there. And then I shape the, the back, cut it off, you know, and, and I have my stud, uh, you know, that will go through the, the hole and, and all. So once I've got this on, I'll put the studs on because if I put the studs on first, it'll be too hard to uh, to solder and I'll hit my knuckles on it uh, and all. And that's how I figured out it's better to do it <laughs> <laughs> without the studs on there. Yeah. And, all. and the same goes with these wing nuts, you know, cast them and all, uh, put it on the lathe, drill it, then I put it on the bench, tap it and all to get the, the thread on here. So that's kind of how we're, you know, you do the, uh, 
do the breastplate. Now, when we get to the uh, to the bonnet, now this is hammered, you know, and I have a method after I've hammered it yeah, to smooth it out, but, you know. I will take pieces of hardwood that I have a, an edge on it, a, a big, a nice rounded uh, surface, and I will take a, a, a regular hammer, a machinist's hammer, and my block of wood. And, and while this copper is in that form, I will sit there and hammer it and, and work that piece of wood up and down the copper to get it really smooth. And that's why you get such a smooth effect you know, on there. I mean, you can tell that it's, you know, something's been done to the metal. However, it's smooth enough to where you know it really has a, a nice aesthetic appeal to it. You know, so that's how I you know do this. Now the difference: this is hammered. Now this is spun. This is bonded. You know, this is not hammered. Uh, you know, and it's sort of like a flower pot. You know, and it's upside down. But the, this is you know what I start with. And the way you spin things, and you can tell if something is spun copper. Typically, if you look at it really closely, you know you'll see fine lines of it going through, and that's from the spinning process. And what they do is uh, take a, you know, if this were flattened out, you know, it'd probably be you know 20, 30 inches across, something like that. Cut out your disc um, to spin it. Uh, it gets annealed, but heat, you know. Take heat and, uh, and and heat the copper up. Let it uh, relax. A lot of the machinists call it relaxing the metal, you know, and it just makes it easier to uh, to spin. And it's done on a spinning lathe. And a spinning lathe uh, is a, a lathe that has a gap in the bed to allow for such what we call a large swing, you know, to put this big piece on. And what you do is you'll uh, Put it on the lathe. Uh, there's a pattern on the lathe when they're putting it on. My grandfather came up with a, a wood pattern, you know, of this bonnet, you know, and the wood pattern goes on the headstock. It's called the part of the lathe that spins around, you know. And so you take the, uh, you know, you take the, uh, you take the pattern. It's mounted on the headstock. And then you put the sheet over it. And then you know, uh, uh, push, uh, hold it in place, and start the lathe that's spinning. And they have bars you know, with spinning. Spinners have bars with like small wheels on the end of it. And uh, and basically, there's a fulcrum there. And they will sit there. They will turn. You know, push against it, the, and, and these the bar will sit there and push that middle around the form. You know, and it does not take long. Uh, to, to spin it. I mean, once it's on and going, a couple minutes, uh, you know, this thing's going, you know, it's it's formed, you know, and it comes off and all. And then uh, what I have done is, you know, I, I figured, you know what, let's try and save as much effort as possible. So I had, you know, I try to remove the lines while it's still on the lathe, uh, you know, and, and erase as much as possible. You don't get all of it, you can still see it on there, you know, but you don't see it on the finished one, you know, at the end, it's it's completely removed. Uh, so you get that clean mirror finish, you know, uh, where you see no swirl marks, you don't see anything. It's just, you know, just like a mirror, you know. So, you know, you start with this, uh, you know, with this bonnet, you know, shaped like this. Now, my grandfather's first helmet, before we started using one piece, uh, we have another cast iron mandrel, a big form at my shop. That is uh, basically it is the bottom half here. Uh, you know, up to the this I call this the equator of the bonnet. And what I do is, and what he would do is hammer you know, a piece of copper into this bowl, uh, in, into the form, and create what you know is basically a bowl. You know, uh, you know this much. Thing. And then he would take copper, wrap it around the bottom here. He would, his brazing was so good, you know, he would take the bowl and, and then wrap a sheet of copper uh, around the bottom, braze it here to where you could not even tell that he had, uh, that he, what he had done. It looked like one solid piece and all. 
and you know that's how he would originally do his his bonnet. Now, when you look at uh, old sponge diving helmets, uh, traditionally they have what we call a castellated a castellated cap on it. If you come up here and you look at this, there's a cap right here. And when I say castellated, like a castle wall goes up and down and all, the piece here uh, goes in and out like a castle. And so does the, uh, the piece that it matches to and it's patched together. And then they'll solder and raise it, you know, finally to where you know, it's hard to see, but you can always see the castellations, you know, in that. And that's how, you know, the typical way uh, of making a, sponge diving helmets. Uh, that's how I'm getting most of it. It's very good at it and all. And then work the piece, another piece of copper down from that, you know, create it, create this part first, add the cap in, and all to close it off. And then there'll be a seam that you can't really see here and under here is where they put the seam because Otherwise, you'd have a large seam where you can see it, but here, you know, with the uh, with the portals in the way that takes away most of that anyway. You know, so you know, that's how that's done, and that's the difference between how my grandfather came up with the idea of doing helmets, you know, and the way it was traditionally done. That's another uh, difference that I mentioned earlier. How he does, you know. So one of the things you know that you when we're doing diving helmets and you look at it, uh, we take a lot for granted uh, to do it. Uh, there's no rule that says it, it's going to come out symmetrically. Um, you, know, you know, we take for granted the portholes going to be, all of them are going to be oriented correctly. There's no rule that says you can't goof this up and have, you know, things not quite right or uh, one of the things that fascinate me, you know, on the sides, you know, are they, you know, is one slightly off this way? I mean, it's a it's a globe, so it could be off, you know, a lot of different ways and stuff. So I had to come up with my own method of uh, of laying it out before I put the portholes on. How I, you know, measure and I do things just to ensure that I'm not faced with. Uh, looking at something that's just slightly off and trying to go back and, and correct it and something like that. And so that's just a little one of my little peccadillos, you know, when I'm when I'm making stuff. I'm, I can be very uh, uh, obsessive, uh, as you can see with my work <laughs> and, and all. So what I do is first thing I do when I've got the helmet, uh, the bonnet, is I want to put the uh, I want to give it some support, you know, because you know you can, if you wanted to, you could, you know, bend it. You know, it flexes some. So what I do is, you know, you know I'll, I'll solder the the neck ring on. You know, is the first thing I'll do to to get to where I want it. You know, and then once I've got that together, that's when I'll start the cutting the out for the main porthole. You know, to 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 mount. And so I'll cut that hole out. And then again, I have a method of, of flaring it. It's all by hand. Um, I don't have a, a device that extrudes that I put in, although I thought about making one that uh, extrudes the metal, you know, where I just keep tightening something, it comes through and pushes the metal up. I'll, I have a small, you know, a little small machinist hammer. I'll just take and I'll just start working it around and all and flaring it almost a circular motion with my hand when I'm hitting it. And, and, and working it up, you know, and, and taking it around like that. And it takes a, a while to do. And again, there's no rule that says it's going to come out the way you want it. Uh, you know, so it's something that I really worked hard on. It's just one of the things that I think is one of the last things I think I start to perfect, uh, you know, as I, you know, made these diving helmets. You know, it was just important to me to have it just look natural to where, you know, you can't tell, you know, how I did it, you know, you won't see, you don't see hammer marks on that, which there are plenty of, you don't see any of the, uh, the crinkles and stretch places, you know, marks on there uh, from working it and stretching the metal and stuff. So, you know, it's just kind of a tough thing to get, 
especially in the crease, when you look in that, in, in, into the crease where the bonnet and the flare meet, you know, that's, I'll sit there and look, are there any scratches? Is there anything in there? So, you know, that's the first thing I'll do is put in the main porthole. And then I'll go ahead and, and do the sides uh, mm -hmm. next. And then of course, lastly, I'll put this, the top light. Now, if you'll notice, uh, a lot of the helmets uh, that I see one in this room, it doesn't have uh, a top light, a fourth light on there. You know? Now, in sponge diving, you know, it's important to have that, that fourth light, that top light there. And the reason is when you're diving, sponge diving, the boat is not an anchor. I know, you know, it's called fishing the diver. You know, the, the boat's not anchored, the diver uh, jumps in and he starts going into the current. Uh, he's typically running almost, bent over, running into the current with that sponge hook in his hand and the collection bag in the other hand, you know, and he's in a zigzag pattern going along the bottom there, looking for sponge and all, and the boat's basically following him. And a sponge boat, uh, and when you go into the exhibit, you'll see a, a wonderful uh, model of a sponge boat. But there's a there's not a steering wheel in SpongeBob. It's a tiller, you know, and a rudder. And so the tiller is standing down, you know, in the in the hatch and the hole, and all. And and the, the bow of the SpongeBob, of course, is is up high. So you have, you know, the the, the deck hand up on the front with the safety line. But he's up there and he's pointing to the you know the captain who's back there, you know, forty five feet behind him, you know, this way or this way, you know. With he, because he's following the bubbles of the diver and letting line, uh, letting a hose out, you know. And when you're going into the current, you know, the hose is not going directly down to the diver, but the hose is basically going back down around back of the boat, you know, and it's almost coming up because you're in the current and he's going and collecting seaweed and things, but also uh, the potential for the hose to get wrapped around the prop is there and that's why on sponge boats you'll see there are propeller guards on there and that's to keep the the uh, the hose from getting wrapped around that prop you know and uh, you know and harming the diver you know so you know that's that's kind of how it's how it's done you know and you know how he keeps his focus there and goes on the boat uh, following him uh, so back to the uh, to the helmet. Now, you know, talking about the outside and all. I mean, these these diving helmets. Uh, there's there are vents in there, and I can show you. When you look in this helmet, uh, you can see the uh, air vents in there. And all, and and the way uh, my grandfather would always refer to it as the stavro or cross. It looks sort of like a cross and all, but the vents, the way he does, you know, they're designed is for the air to flow out and hit the glass. You can see them. Uh, there's three of them. There, one down the middle and two on each side, and all, and the air comes out. And you know, and, and flows onto the glass. So one of the things I'm doing, you know, I have a pattern that he had made years ago. This is what that vent looks like, you know, the shape. So what I'll do is again on the copper, take trace it out, cut it out. I have a metal form that is a slightly smaller than this, you know, by probably a, a three sixteenths, uh, maybe not quite a quarter inch. Uh, Clamp together, and then I'll work the copper around that metal form so that it creates a channel. It's not a flat piece of copper in there, but it's actually a channel, you know. And again, yeah, have a, the uh, the place in back where you saw this coming out of is this piece, and I have a form for this that he made out of wood. A really cool little piece of wood block that my grandfather chiseled out. You know that form, so I use, still use it, and I hammer it in to get the cup back again. That's how they come out this way, then one this way, and one that way. You know, and that's what's on the inside there. And the 
the other thing that's on the inside, you know, I talked about portholes, but uh, again, you know, we make everything, the valve, the valve assemblies, you name it, you know, so I have, you know, rough castings for the uh, elbow and back of the helmet and all, and for the uh, exhaust valve. This one. Here, you know, here's what they look like from the foundry, you know, this, and then, of course, here's what they look like when they've been machined and all. And this thing in the back, this is a, a check valve. And it has this valve in it, the valve seat. And what this does, this is where the hose uh, attaches in the back of the helmet and all. And the reason this check valve is so important is should something happen to that hose uh, when the diver is down and all, uh, this, you know, it's, it's open, you know, air is blowing through, it's open. Should something happen uh, to that hose, it creates a, an incredible vacuum. And so this thing snaps shut and all from that vacuum. Uh, and so the diver still has air, you know, to hopefully get out of trouble and all. But uh, yeah, should this fail, you know, and something happens to the hose, you know, it's, uh, it will crush the diver. It creates a fantastic uh, a pressure uh, differential. And it doesn't take much water at all, deep water uh, at, at all to, uh, you know, for disaster to, uh, to strike a diver. You know. So it's really, you know, important <clears throat> to uh, be precise. You know, when you're making diving helmets, you know, it's very, diving is very unforgiving. And, uh, and so, you know, the precision is, uh, you know, is, is paramount of, you know, when, you're, when you're creating these parts. You know, you have uh, this valve, but the, it's paramount in every in, in every part you make, but that's one of the, the most critical areas. Another critical area I'm talking about it is you know the neck ring the, between the bonnet and the breastplate. You know there's a leather seal. Now I didn't really say anything uh, about it yet. Speak to it, but uh, on these helmets there are no O rings. You know it didn't have O rings. You know all these helmets since uh, you know the 1800s are you know copper brass glass and leather you know i brought the i use like three different thicknesses of leather this is the thickness obviously for the the neck ring i don't know that i use and there's a recess here so you know i cut out a big ring you know, sort of like that except pretty big you know that fits down in that recess and there's a way you know that uh, that i was taught to uh, fit the uh, the, the helmet to the bon uh, the bonnet to the uh, breastplate and all uh, where I mark it and I can tell where it needs to be shaved or, or you know uh, down so it's all level and the entire surface of the ring uh, makes contact with that leather and you get a nice seal otherwise you know the, the diver is going to be complaining to you that uh, you know I'm getting wet stuff water is squirting in and the deeper I go it seems to squirt in a little harder and stuff so yeah the uh, yeah and another way thing I wanted to point out is when we're making the way we do the, the seals on these is like for this these two parts screw together and it's basically a compression seal and what we do is you take, you know, uh, leather, glass, and then another leather seal on top of it, like a sandwich, and then you screw it together, and it compresses, you know, and tighten it. Um, I've gotten to the point where I I can you know, I know uh, precisely how much to machine, and with my seals, I can tighten it all the way. Yet there's no gap uh, when you look at the uh, the uh, my uh, the portholes, there's no gap, you know, the, this part is all the way flush to the back, and you know, even though it is tight and sealed at the same time. On your front ports, um, like with the Navy Mark V, the window is on a oh, hinge, so yes. you can open it. But on the sponge helmets, yeah. are they fixed? Yeah, they're, they're all, they are fixed. Um, they weren't really meant to be 
opened and closed. I'm sure the military had a reason for why they wanted helmets to be uh, able to open. You know, I always thought it was in the movies so that the guy sits down the opening and shoves a cigarette in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure, it was, I'm sure yeah. that's not the reason. <laughs> you know, I don't know that answer of why they do it, but yeah, it's not done on any of the, the helmets. Even when you see uh, helmets like Avieri Nose here that have these buttons on here, these weren't really meant uh, to be undone, you know, on an ongoing basis and closed. What this is more for is to put a bar across here mm -hmm. and open it uh, and to get it off, you know, should you need to, you know, to access uh, uh, the front porthole. Now, you can tell what's really cool about this helmet is it's got both of these buttons. You see so many diving helmets, old helmets, where I can tell when someone has tried to remove the porthole because they have broken these off. It will happen every time, but it's because uh, grass over time uh, submerged in salt water becomes brittle, you know, and unless you really know how to lose, if you just go right now and try to open this, we'll break these, I will break them. I mean, you have to know they need it and how to really break it loose before you, uh, you know, even try and, and use these to uh, unscrew them. The helmet, yeah, but yeah, all the all fishery helmets, you know, particularly sponge helmets, are all fixed uh, face plates. And you also talk about fishery helmets that they don't need the grates like yeah. the salvage helmet. Would. Yeah, when you see uh, the, the helmets with the uh, the grates on them, you know, uh, those are either the military helmets or their uh, uh, commercial hats used primarily to salvage work. Uh, Anywhere where there's dirty water, uh, the potential uh, for objects to strike that place, you know, if you're in a hole or you're doing something and working and you turn, you don't see the, you know, a, a piece of metal sticking out, you can crack your glass or do something. That's what those grates are there to prevent. Now, sponging is all open water diving. Uh, you know, there are, there are no uh, obstacles that are going to, you know, uh, crack your glass and all. Plus, you know, uh, visually, you know, vision is very important uh, to a sponge diver, you know, because that's his whole purpose is down there to find sponge. Commercial guys uh, already know what the job is, what the mission is, you know, whether they're going down on a platform over the side on a large ship to repair something that's, you know, uh, to avoid having to drive off the ship, you know, you know so they're down, they know what they're going to be doing about sponging. Yeah, you know, you you really need your vision because you're kicking up. You know, you're working. Uh, it gets it can be silty, and all sponge are covered. You know, they they don't look like this underwater at all. You know, they're they have a skin over them. You know, the, the, a really dark skin with a zillion little pinholes, and we will see silt. I mean, you know, there's silt on them. They're not just sitting there, but They've been there a while, you know, and currents and silt and everything has gone over them. So you really have to know what you're looking for. And again, you know, vision is really important, to, you know, in that respect. Yes. Uh, uh, as you went through, I kind of imagine that um, uh, the leather that uh, you have on the glass uh, could be uh, maybe a uh, area of, of failure. Um, is there a way that, uh, or taking a step back, is there an area of a uh, failure that? Uh, you've noticed on some of the earlier um, uh, diving helmets that you made an improvement on, or just you know something that you give advice to when someone is using a helmet that you uh, yeah, I mean, leather over time, you know, uh, will deteriorate. Uh, I'm surprised the helmets how long they lasted. I've, I've uh, restored a lot of helmets. I come across a lot of uh, antiquities people bring me to restore and all, and I'm surprised at the condition of these helmets. These guys use this piece of equipment for decades, you know. I've, I've, uh, and, and the copper is worn so thin, when I put a light to it, I can actually see pinholes in, in the helmet. You know, I can see little pinholes here and there, you know. And, you know, I, I know the pinholes didn't form in the closet, you know, sitting there, you know. This happened, 
you know, while they're working it, and you know, and water's leaking in. So these guys, you know, it, it was a hard scrabble life, you know, and uh, you know, on most of them were just trying to, to scratch out a living and, and stuff. And uh, it's amazing, you know, the, what they did and what they worked with, you know, and the repairs they made themselves. I noticed as I come across helmets, and I figured it wasn't that they probably didn't want to have an expert, you know, like my grandfather or Yeti knows repair their helmet. They probably didn't want to spend the money, you know, and and all, and and made do and patched them any way they could uh, to get out there. You know, the, I think we have a couple of uh, questions that have come through our chat. Yes. So the first question is from Valerie. She said she is wondering if uh, your grandfather knew her grandfather, who is a marine electrical engineer in Key West from 1905 to the 1930s, named Roscoe Roberts. Um, <laughs> that's a intro. I don't recall the name, you know, uh, from my grandfather's stories. Uh, you know, I'd have to do some research uh, to see, you know, if, 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 if there's some uh, connection there, you know, perhaps to the archives at the Historical Society or perhaps uh, down here, you know, with Lies uh, there, although they were, uh, again, it's a small world, the world of diving, I would, you know, wouldn't be surprised, you know, did, did their paths cross and all, you know, I don't know that. <laughs> Um, this one's from Harrison Albert. He asks, do you still make helmets on commission and how much would a custom one cost? Oh, <laughs> I do. <laughs> yes, I do make custom helmets. Uh, they are $25,000 uh, for me to make you one. Again, the, the time and effort involved uh, is, uh, they're not easy to do. And the expense in making a helmet, it costs me thousands of dollars to to start a helmet, you know, it takes me thousands of dollars uh, to to get going, you know, uh, to, to put into it, you know. So it, it's yeah, it's a really a, a, a an expensive uh, item if you look at it that way. On the other side of the coin, of uh, you know, uh, there are the days uh, the old timers used to tell me when I was a kid, your papa, my grandfather, would uh, only charge two hundred fifty dollars for a diving helmet. And so, of course, this was, you know, 1920 or whatever. <laughs> you know, you know, and that was righteous money, you know, back then, you know. But, the, you know, when you look at the, you know, again, three months of time and, and the effort and all to, to go. And when I do it, it's, it's a, I don't just jump in and make it and then stop and do something else and come back to it. It's sort of a, a commitment at a, at a certain level where I have to get myself psyched up to, to make a diving helmet. You know, I will sit there, you know, in my chair down at the shop. And uh, it's almost like before a game, you know, you're getting psyched up. Okay, you know, <laughs> well, you know, this is going to be a long trip, you know, and you, if, if you're not in the right frame of mind, you know, it's torture and, and stuff. So, you know, I, I get into that uh, frame of mind and then I go. And when I, once I start, you know, I may do 12 hour, 14 hour days, you know, uh, if I'm in a groove and I'm going. Then there are other processes that are just so tedious on here and so precise where you just can't make a mistake. You know, that, you know, after five, six, seven hours, you know, you're just burned out. And, you know, I'll sit there, I go, you know, should I get up, you know, and, and, and do some more and all that. I say, you know what? go get rested, come back tomorrow fresh, you know, with a fresh set of eyes and jump into it. And, you know, things are gonna work out way better because I know uh, after you get to a certain point on there, you know, if you make a mistake, there's it's hours and hours, if you're lucky, you know, to undo, you know, whatever it is that you've done and all. So it's it's one of these things almost like a surgery, except, you know, the, the, the patient isn't going to uh, isn't gonna die, but, um, you know, Helmet maker, provide uh, <laughs> <laughs> something. It turns out, to, you know, to, to not be uh, up to up to my standards. You know. The next question uh, for the studs and portholes: Do you use standard threads, like unified threads, or similar? Do I use standard threads uh, or SAE threads? Is that what they're asking? Probably uh, the fine threads. Mm -hmm. um, 
everything uh, on the helmet has a different, uh, it's a different thread. Uh, I've seen helmets that seem to, where they look like they were using the same thread count on everything. That's not how I do it. Uh, you know, uh, this is seven threads per inch here, it's great big threads. Uh, it is a standard uh, 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 thread and they are all standard. Uh, I don't, you know, I have standard gauges of the threads that I use, um, but uh, it's, I don't create oddball uh, threads, you know, something instead of 24 uh, threads per inch, I'll come up with, for some reason, I want to do it 25 or something like that. I just don't, but everything is different. You know, this, now this is a, what's called a submarine thread uh, on the valve here. Uh, on the uh, uh, check valve. It's 17 threads, a real odd, it is an oddball uh, size and it's on purpose. Uh, you know, it, it's called a sub thread. And the idea with this is anywhere uh, in any pursuit uh, underwater where, you know, uh, a hose is supposed to hook up to something real fast, you know it's gonna hook up because it's a standard sub thread and it's gonna be 17 inches. I mean, 17 threads per inch and all. And uh, it was my grandfather to, to, uh, to get the uh, 17 threads per inch on the lathe, uh, he had to figure out, work the problem backwards. He had to figure out the gearing to, to, for the lathe that I've got in my notes. I changed the gears on one of on my small lathe that was from the 1890s. I, he figured out uh, you know, the gear pattern to come up so when I started all the different gears, it, this moves at 17 threads per inch, you know. So that's really interesting, you know, uh, doing that. But yeah, they're all different threads. You know, the threads on the portholes um, are different, you know, and they are a they are a SAE fine thread, but they are all a standard uh, thread. You know, it's nothing really on all except for that sub thread. And it's not really something unique to us. It's just something that exists in the dive industry. When you hear somebody say, you know, a sub thread, you know, it's 17 threads per inch. And I think it's an inch and an eighth somewhere in there. I'm trying to remember exactly what the, the measurement is. I get lazy sometimes because all I have to do is put my calipers on it, take that measurement and transfer it over to, to the thing. We've got a couple more questions, and then we know that we've already gone over our time. So we thank the people that are still on and the people that are here. We're we're all helmet geeks, so this, this is like so fast. Let's just keep going. But, yeah. but let's do our our last three questions here. Okay, this one's from Sally Bauer. Where is your workshop now? I missed your wonderful sign last time. I was in Trenton Springs. Sally, the shop is still there. Uh, <laughs> uh, we first met many, many years ago. Uh, you know, when I was in my uh, in my teens, you know, like 20 years ago, hadn't it been? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the shop is still there, and uh, can't wait to see you there in the shop. But, and I'll uh, miss you and miss seeing you. But yeah, <laughs> I'm still kicking, the, the shop is still kicking. It's all the same, it looks the same as the last time uh, you were there and Joe was there. And uh, you know, the same equipment, uh, my shop uh, for all of you is like taking a step back in time. You know, not only what I do is a, an ancient uh, <laughs> craft, but I do it out of an ancient uh, machine shop. Uh, you know, when you're in my shop, uh, it looks the way machine shops look for 150 years. You know, I've seen the photographs uh, doing research of different helmets I've restored from the uh, 1860s in Greece. I've looked at the, the photos of the machine shops and the old timers in there. And there's just something so kindred uh, when I'm looking at these old photos, the equipment I'm looking at and everything, it almost feels like uh, my shop, you know. As your grandfather passed this skill on to you, have you found a way to pass the skill on to someone else? I knew I was going to get that <laughs> question. You know, I get that asked all the time. Um, uh, no, I have. I don't have an apprentice. Uh, the situation, you know, that I grew up in. My situation was, you know, I had a grandfather. We all lived in the same house. My grandparents, my parents, uh, my sister, and I. You know. And the reason I ended up down at the machine shop from a young age was to get me out of 
uh, my grandmother's hair. Both my parents worked, my mom and dad worked, you know, Yaya or my grandmother um, was at the house, you know, cooking and doing and cleaning and stuff. And a lot of times she's getting me out of her hair. Grandpa would take me down to the boat yard in the machine shop to, you know, to be there. And I just loved it and, and, and all. So, I, what was the question? <laughs> You're a <laughs> yeah, Don't you get so it? Yeah. And so the situation uh, of, of this loving grandfather um, was a brilliant man and a brilliant teacher. I mean, he was just a great teacher in everything he taught me. Uh, and, and, and all, uh, you know, how does that get, uh, you know, how does that uh, repeat it? You know, I mean, uh, you know, again, it's his family, you know, it started me not even knowing that I was learning and stuff. Uh, I, I, I don't know what the future holds. But I don't really foresee, you know, something you know, uh, like that occurring, you know, to to where, uh, you know, I would have an apprentice, and uh, you know, I I tell them, you know, go to college, or you know, if you want to make more money than a helmet maker, I don't know, be a bartender, or something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, the last question uh, was what kind of solder do you use when assembly? Uh, the solder that I use is uh, sixty forty. Uh, the solder, uh, you know, it's a sixty forty uh, no, lead tin, uh, it, it is what that is. It's not silver solder. I found silver solder to be uh, uh, too hard and brittle uh, to work with, you know, and all. Uh, and I guess my grandfather did as well because that's you know how I was taught, you know, to use uh, you know the uh, the sixty forty solder, and then of course we use a flux, a liquid flux, you know, ahead of time for all. Heat the copper and the brass surfaces you know, to be clean and all, add the flux, and then feed the solder into it. And we have uh, one more from our audience. So, with your brass plate and your bottom, what size copper are you using? The thickness? Yeah, is it 16 ounce or? Um, I'm trying to think of the ounce. Um, it would be, I think, 16 or 18, somewhere in there. And all the thickness, uh, I believe, is around three thirty seconds, yeah. something like that. Now the uh, the bonnet is a little thicker uh, than that, uh, but uh, you know, you think that that's a uh, you know a, a thin a thin piece of copper. However, you know, and you could see me flexing the bonnet, you know, before I put in the neck ring. However. Once you know you achieve, once you've hammered it out, you know the the, the, the copper out uh, the shape. It achieves a certain level of structural integrity to where you know you can't. There is no you know you can't bend this and make it flex. You know the way it is now. So it doesn't really take a, a heavier uh, gauge than that for what we do. You know in the open fisheries. Although you know again military helmets. You know the commercial helmets. They use they're, they're using much thicker copper or their cast brass that they're, they're using as well. All right, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we've spent so much time in the last year preparing for this exhibit. Oh, she said I'm not on camera. We just do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, we spent so much time doing your research about sponge history and sponge diving, even specifically in Tartan Springs. But hearing your actual stories, your stories of your grandfather teaching you. I, has had such a layer of interest to this story. So thank you for sharing it with us. And I think we'll have to find a way to share it within the exhibits as well. Thank you so much for having me. All right, thank you. We have a membership for you for the next year. Cool. You can come back and see thank us anytime. So and I hope that you do. I will take you up on that. Now we have two other new members tonight. So thank you for coming <laughs> to our Merch Yourself Talk in person. It's great to have people here again. And thanks for joining our team. Thank you guys. And thank you all for